Good morning. Before we begin, please let, remind, let me remind all of you to silence your cell phones to show respect to our visitor and those around you. I appreciate that very much. Now, thank all of you for coming here today. I am Dr. Jeannie Bryan, Professor of English and Chair of the Department of English and Modern Languages here at JSW. I'd like to welcome our students, faculty, staff, and the visitors to our campus. Thank you all for coming. Those of you who know me will be a little surprised to hear that when Andy Davidson agreed to come do a reading, a book signing, and a workshop for us, I actually bounced a little. Um, okay, I bounced a lot. Um, because we are a small campus in rural Georgia, we rarely get to welcome authors here. This is an unusual treat for us. Because of that, I hope he will forgive me if I'm a bit effusive in my introduction. Mr. Davidson received his undergraduate degree from Washata Baptist University and his MFA from the University of Mississippi. He currently teaches English online at Middle Georgia State University. He has been published in a variety of literary journals, including the Santa Clara Review and Drunken Boat. His debut novel, In the Valley of the Sun, has received some rather impressive praise, which highlights how fortunate we are to have him here with us today. At risk of excluding much of the notable attention his most recent work has received since its publication this summer, I'll share a couple of highlights with you. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly called it a bold, confident debut, which successfully makes the lines between genre and literary fiction blend together in a complex novel of horror, human nature, and the American South. While Booklist, in another starred review, said, this is not your typical vampire novel. The story drips with atmosphere. As a literature scholar who studies both the literary South and the Gothic, I absolutely concur with these reviewers. He has done something unique with his book, something that speaks truth about our humanity, our monstrosity, and what happens when those lines blur. Before I ramble a dissertation in his honor, without further delay, it is my honor to welcome Andy Davidson, author of In the Valley of the Sun, to Georgia Southwestern State University. Um, thank you, Dr. Bryan, and thanks to the English Department and GSW for having me. Um, just looking out here, I'm blown away by the size of the crowd. <laughs> I'm used to doing events at, at, at bookstores where we have maybe five to six people, and that's a good crowd. So thank you for coming. Um, I have three pieces here that I'd like to read to you uh, from the novel. And rather than try and set the first one up, I'm just going to jump right into it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we can talk a little bit about the book between the other two. But. This novel takes place in West Texas in 1980. He sat for a while in the close, quiet dark of the bedroom, black straw bullhide in his lap. The woman lay on the bed in a slant of blue nightlight. She was naked, small boned, pallid and pretty. Her eyes were wide and red with burst capillaries and fixed on the ceiling where a brown water stain had long since faded, the flesh beneath her jaw purpled over. Outside, a scrim of light lay over the world and the wind scraped blades of yucca along the trailer's metal shell. Directly, he stood from the chair and picked up the stuffed bear he had set aside, its one eye black and shining. Somewhere in the deep silence of the Alcona, a clock was ticking. He put the bear back in the chair and pulled his hat low on his head and went out of the woman's trailer, which was set back in a sweet-smelling juniper grove. From Fredericksburg, he drove the pickup and cab over 300 miles without stopping. The sun rose over rolling hills and tight, gnarled groves of live oaks wrapped in mist. He took a thin strip of blacktop toward Rock Springs, then on south until he came to a great green body of water beyond which lay Mexico. From here he hooked back north, sinking the pickup and camper into the land like a barb. He drove with no destination in mind, Del Rio, Comstock, Langtree, 
the true desert west of the Pecos where the highway emptied out onto a vast scrub plain. Dry washes snaking beneath bridges where the bones of animals lay bleaching in the sun. He drove just under the limit and rode the narrow shoulder when bigger rigs passed. Ernest Tubb warbled on the radio. At twilight, he pulled off for gas in a wasted town where the wind never ceased banging metal against metal. He stood away from the pumps and smoked a cigarette while a boy in overalls filled the pickup's tank. The sun bled out in colors of orange and pink, and he wiped away the tears the wind brought. The boy was a half-breed, rangy with muscle. He walked with a limp and glowered and spoke no words of peace or friendship. He gave the boy three dollars, ground his cigarette beneath the flat of his boot, and drove on into the mounting dark. It was night when he stopped again at a roadside bar west of a town called Cielo Rojo. Calhoun's was spelled out in red neon above the porch, the cantina's only extravagance, the rest of the place all cinder blocks and tin, white paint peeling from the blocks and showing faded blue beneath. It was a sad, sturdy place at the edge of a low, dry forest of mesquite. Across the highway, a set of railroad tracks ran from one end of the night to the other. He parked the pickup and cab over in a pool of orange arc sodium light. A train was passing, and he stood in the lot and watched it, enjoying the steady, percussive rhythm of its going, like a knife punching holes in the night. He went inside the bar for a beer and found, plugged into the back wall near the toilets, a Wurlitzer stereo with a handwritten note taped below the selector switches. Works, new in 1963, management. The chrome was flecking and the cabinet was cracked. He looked around. The only other patron sat alone in a corner, an old abuela with a face like a canyon. She wore a thin silk blouse with a bow at the throat. Her hand shook when she reached for the glass of whiskey in front of her. The bartender was a white man, big and silver-haired and bored behind his register, working a crossword with a chewed pencil. The place was cool and dim and pleasant. He bought a can of pearl with the last two dollars he had, then dropped a quarter in the Wurlitzer. He punched a number and settled down at a table and tipped his chair back against the wall and put his boots up. He set his hat over his eyes and drifted in the peaceful dark of not being on the road. The man in the box began to sing. The music rose and fell. Out of the darkness came her scent of lemon and vanilla, the curve of a white calf beneath the hem of a pale blue cotton dress, her shape an hourglass like time itself slipping away. She, before the picture window that looked out on the mimosa, dropping its pink petals on the grass, her slow smile spreading beneath a pair of eyes blue as cobalt glass, water sheeting on the window and casting its shadow like a spell of memory on the wall behind, her little red turntable suitcase scratching out a song beneath the window, and he, a boy, with his bare feet on hers as she held his hands and the record turned and they danced their private, sad melody unspooling in his heart forever. The song played out at three minutes. In the silence that followed, a voice spoke inside his head. A woman's voice, soft and clear and sweet, and the word she spoke was his name, Travis. He heard the clatter of a quarter dropping and opened his eyes and tilted his hat back on his head and saw a woman who was not the woman he had been dreaming of. No woman ever was. But all women were measured against the dream, the memory, and so far all had come up wanting. This woman stood alone at the Wurlitzer in a white summer dress with red flower print. Her skin was light as bone, her hair as red as a fortunate sky. She punched her selection and turned and looked at him and her eyes were large and round and green and she was not, he saw, so much a woman as a girl, 17, maybe 18, but the way she stood, alone before the box and somehow apart from the world, made her seem so much older. I like this song, she said, and her voice was the voice that had spoken inside his head. The man in the box began to sing again the same sad warble. Travis dropped his boots and set his chair on all fours. She held the hem of her dress between her fingers and began to sway. She closed her eyes and tipped her head back to bear a long white throat the old song working through her, Travis thought, like a slow, hot wire. He saw where neck joined shoulder, an old white scar, blade thin. 
She wore a gold locket, an oval-shaped clasp, the kind to hold pictures inside. It glinted in the scant bar light. The flowers of her dress were deep crimson, and they spilled down from her waist like blood. Her lips, the lightest shade of pink, moved around the words of the song, but no song came out of her. Her skin so pale, his heart beating faster now. She moved toward him, swaying. Her red leather cowgirl scuffed concrete. He slid his right hand to the buckle of his brown leather belt, ran his thumb over the eagle there, its outstretched wings, its talons curved and sharp. Travis. She opened her arms like a flower unfolding and slipped sideways onto his knee. She was in his lap and the tips of her fingers had found his cheeks before he knew it was happening and when they touched his skin, he started because her fingers were cold. His own hand moved to the knife he wore on his hip, a K-bar and a leather scabbard, its handle cut crudely from iron wood into the shape of an eagle's head, cut to match his buckle. She smiled, pushed his black bullhide far back on the crown of his head, traced her fingers down from his hairline and along his crooked nose, lingered over his lips, her touch like a snake's tongue finding its way. His grip around the knife eased. She took his hand in her palm and pressed her fingers against the pulse of his wrist and spun them lightly, as if unlocking a combination. A jolt shot through him like he touched his hand to an electric fence. He twitched and his beer tipped and spilled and ran over the table and pattered on the floor. Red spots fired behind his eyes like he'd stared full on into the sun. The world went white, a curtain dropped, a gauzy membrane through which the world looked faint, like after rain rising from a hot road or his own breath fogging his windshield. But then he was back, as sudden as he had left, only he felt slow and stupid now, and he knew somehow that he was no longer himself. She put her lips to his ear and whispered, I know your name, boy. Her breath was terrible, like something gone off, spoiled deep inside. A thing was happening to him, a momentous, monstrous thing. Still holding his hand, still smiling, she pulled him up and out of his chair, and now he was leaving the table, stumbling along behind her, helpless not to follow as she drew him across the floor and out of the bar and into the dark. And the old woman never looked up from her whiskey, and the bartender never looked up from his puzzle. The man in the box sang on. So this is the prologue of the novel. Um, and it is a horror novel. And um, I write horror. And people often look at me and say, why does a nice guy write horror? Um, to which I think my response has become, maybe I'm a nice guy because I write horror. <laughs> maybe there's something cathartic about it. Um, but no, um, I like horror. Um, Travis is, is the hero of the book, a very unconventional hero in a lot of ways. So I thought what I would do is kind of just read you the brief synopsis, um, not necessarily the copy that's on the book, but just sort of to give you an idea of all the players in the story and what it's generally about. And, um, and then I'll move on to the next passage. Um, so In the Valley of the Sun tells the story of Travis Stilwell, a killer of women, haunting the honky-tonks of West Texas in the year 1980. We catch up with him at a low point after a pale-skinned girl in red cowboy boots, whom you just met, leaves him weak and bloodied in his cab over camper. Flat broke, he takes up with a young widow and her boy who run a dying motel at the edge of the desert. Now by day, he works odd jobs around the motel, finding a strange sort of family in the boy and his mother. But with every sunset, in the dark cave of his cab over camper, Travis fights a terrible transformation, as a creature even more monstrous than the killer that he was awakens inside him. And this new creature is plagued by an unspeakable ancient hunger. So that's the blurb. Um, as Dr. Bryan pointed out, it is a vampire novel. Um, the book does not actually contain the word vampire. That was a deliberate choice on my part. Let's not use the word vampire because these days, when we think of vampires, we tend to think less of scary creatures and things that sparkle. Um, so you've met Travis and you've met Rue. Um, 
You've seen Rue at her best. That previous reading is kind of Rue doing her Rue thing when Rue is at her, the height of her powers. Um, but when you're writing a vampire novel, uh, or at least when I am, you want to find some type of empathy with all of the characters, not necessarily just the characters that are the victims. Uh, you also want the monsters to have some sort of pathos to them. And life is hard for a vampire in my world here. Um, it's not all glamour, it's not all uh, beauty and, and sleekness. Um, they also have low points. And so this is a passage that takes place about a month prior to the one I just read. It's later in the book, it's kind of a flashback. Um, but this is Rue, Fort Worth, 1980, September 22nd. Rue step staggers from the bus in the pre-dawn light, her long trek across the south come to its end at last. She has been moving between the last of summer's long days, time and light always against her. By day she has slept in mildewed threadbare motels and rest stops and culverts. Before New Orleans, it was in the narrow bunk of a truck driver's cab, where the truck driver himself lay cooling and red and damp beside her, his truck idling along an off-ramp between Pascagoula and Gulfport. Now, stomach turning over like an engine that does not know it's dead, she heads up Ninth Street, the air in this city dry and hot and stiff as it hurries her along beneath a moody orange sky. She hugs her arms against her denim jacket, long sleeves to cover the cracked and peeling skin, sunglasses to hide the burst capillaries in her eyes, the ones that come when the blood no longer tolerates the hunger and turns its red teeth upon itself like the mad, crazed thing that it is, and the body turns to dust and dying. Four days now without fresh blood. Not eating, but moving, only moving when the sun goes down. The long southern road, curled into a tight ball of pain at the back of a bus, head pressed against the glass, arms crossed over her stomach to hide the noises her gut makes. Hair a tangle, knees of her jeans near black with dirt and mud. She turns right on Throckmorton, two blocks up, then a left on 7th, moving west, away from the rising sun, her purpose singular, shelter. There is a park, and beyond the park a river, and after the river a bridge, and beneath the bridge a close, thick darkness. She slides down the grassy embankment following the broken sidewalk to the bridge, where she can see the dart and flutter of small black shapes against the warming sky. She hears them as they return to their roosts among iron and concrete, a chorus of high-pitched voices that weave together into a single teeming blanket of night here she climbs over a metal railing and down into a hollow corrugated pipe that juts out over the river. On hands and knees in the dark, the trickling damp, she waits and listens, and the faint sound that comes back to her down the length of the long pipe is that of a man breathing, snoring. And so she crawls far back to where a fetid stink awaits in a clump of rags that rise and fall, and her hands move up and over the rags to separate them from the flesh of the one sleeping beneath them, her fingers encountering a rough, wiry beard, and though the stink is terrible, she takes up a sliver of coffee can from among the garbage at her knees and jabs apart the flesh where neck joins body. And the blood that courses out over the beard is hot and dry like the Texas wind, and the body beneath the rags begins to flail and kick, and the sounds echo back down the pipe and out over the river and are drowned by the constant high trill of the bats beneath the overpass. Inside the pipe, Rue drinks until her stomach is full and the rags are no longer kicking or rising or falling. And then she curls up in the wet and tucks her head into the crook of her arm. And here, where the sun cannot reach, the hunger quieted. Her summer travels at an end. She roosts. She roosts and dreams darkly. So that's Rue. She's a lonely, dangerous creature, kind of a nomad. Um, so it's not a glamorous life, being a vampire. Um, essentially, the novel is kind of a combination of a couple of things. Uh, have any of you ever seen the movie Tender Mercies, with Robert Duvall? You know, the plot of that movie is essentially a down-on-his-luck 
drunken country western singer, kind of washed up, takes up with a woman and her son at a motel in, in Texas. And he does odd jobs for them, and you know he's given shelter, and he overcomes his demons, and and eventually they fall in love and get married. It's a beautiful movie, um, written by Horton Foote, who uh, actually wrote the screenplay for *To Kill a Mockingbird* too. Uh, so it's a very very beautiful movie. Um, and then there's *Taxi Driver*, <laughs> which you may know as well. Uh, also a great movie um, <clears throat> about a serial killer named Travis who, uh, well, I, wanna, I don't know if I characterize him as a serial killer. He's a taxi driver, but he has these bad, dark thoughts. The city around him is dirty. He sees life not living up to his ideals, and he just thinks some horrible storm should come through and just wash all the filth away from this city. So I thought, here you've got a movie about the goodness and light of humanity and tender mercies. And here you've got this movie from the 70s about the darkness of humanity. I thought it'd be fun to kind of put those two things together. Um, <clears throat> and plus, I love Texas. So, you know, Texas as a setting is, is a wonderful thing. Um, so essentially, that's what happens in the book, is after Rue's initial attack on Travis, and her intent is to turn him. It's not to just drink him. It's, it's to actually make him what she is, because she sees in him a kind of affinity uh, a kinship between them. And so um, he takes up with his family, living out at the edge of the desert in, in West Texas. And um, <clears throat> the third thing that I want to read, and this is the last one, uh, deals with the boy, uh, Sandy, Sandy Gaskin. His mother is Annabelle. She owns the motel. Um, and Sandy and Travis form a kind of friendship over the course of the novel. And so um, this passage kind of speaks to something that personally, when, I, when I'm writing horror, I, I want to write what scares me. You know, and I think all of us, the idea of a vampire isn't that scary to us anymore. And so when you, when you want to deal with that subject matter in horror, you've got to ask yourself, well, what scares you? <clears throat> and I think one of the things that really scares me the most in life these days as you get older, and some of you might not relate to this because you're young, and uh, not that I'm that old, but as you get older, you know, time becomes something that kind of frightens you, especially in those late hours at night when you can't sleep. Lying awake in bed, you know, you think about um, what you're losing as time just keeps marching on. And uh, if you're married, as I am, and you have a good marriage, as I do, you also think about the person lying next to you, and you think, you know, there are forces in this world that would conspire to, to take this person from you. I think that's about the most horrible thing I can imagine. And so, in this scene, we have Sandy, who's 11 years old, and he knows that there's a wounded man sleeping in his mother's bed. And why he's there is not really important to the scene, but that man is Travis. And he's starting to put together that Travis, whose camper is parked down by the motel, is not exactly what he seems. He's not this polite, quiet cowboy. There's something darker at work inside Travis. And um, he and his mother have let something evil into their lives, and they didn't know it. So this is the last thing I'm going to read, and then we can take questions or we can talk. Um, but this is the third one. The skies outside were mottled purple and gold as Sandy sat in the empty shed. Inside the cages where the rabbits should have been were half-eaten carrots turning black. He thought of how he and his mother had searched beneath the house and in the scrub fields all last Saturday. Today, his mother had taken Sandy into the kitchen. She had given him milk and tea and milk and tea cakes. Sitting with him at the table, a cold cup of coffee in hand, she had explained that Mr. Stilwell had fallen from the ladder onto his knife. Sandy had thought of the day his mother had broken the news to him, then in the hospital that his father had died. The news punctuated by the sound of a canned soda dropping from a drink machine somewhere nearby. Is Travis dead? He asked. What? No. No, honey, he's just hurt. 
Sandy looked down at his plate and thought about the ladder, the roof, the K-bar knife, and its scabbard. He looked up and said, but how could he fall on it when he keeps it put away? An odd, fretful expression had passed over his mother's face as if she knew the answer, but could not quite remember or could not tell. I guess, she said, fingers tightening around her mug, he had it out when he fell. The boy said, but eat your tea cakes, she said, then go play. Now, sitting quietly in the shed, Sandy spoke aloud, even though there were no rabbits to hear. He said, Travis is in Mama's bed. In Mama's bed and hurt, he thought. Mama took me to the hospital and I stepped on a nail once out by the water tank, so why ain't Travis at the hospital? And why would Mama lie to me, he said. The empty shed had no answer for this. But another voice, a woman's voice, did. That's what mothers do. Sandy leapt to his feet and ran out of the shed and into a wash of amber light, the sun hovering low over the distant hills. He backed up against the weathered farmhouse wall, staring at the crooked shed his father had built. Here, Sandy. He turned and faced the cowboy's cab over camper and pickup at the bottom of the hill behind the motel. The orange farm cat sat on the truck's hood, staring at the sleeper window. Sandy. The boy twitched. The wind came rolling across the valley, the chimes singing from the porch. The old windmill turned and the clothesline in back of the house flapped like wings. The sun was sinking. Come to me, Sandy. For a second, it was as if a bank of clouds had swept over the hills to block the day's last light, and his eyes had fogged over like glass under breath. But neither of these things had really happened, had they? And when he shook his head, the sensation went away. Far away down the hill, he saw the cat scoot backward on the pickup's hood, its ears flattened. It hissed and shrieked away beneath the boardwalk. The boy made sweaty fists at his sides and swallowed. He remembered his mother's bravery the morning they had first seen the camper in their lot and went down the hill. He went on trembling legs, the sun like a lidded eye behind the horizon. He stood at the grill of the truck and looked up at the sleeper window. He saw his reflection there, despite the dirt, a boy distorted in corduroy pants and a long-sleeved green shirt, a mop of blonde hair. He walked round to the back of the camper and stood at the foot of the metal stoop. He felt the steady press of the wind against his back. He took one step onto the stoop and pulled the latch. The camper was locked. He stepped down, thought for a moment fetched a heavy cinder block from a stack near the motel's maintenance closet and dragged it over beneath the kitchenette window. He stood on top of this, just like the baptistry at church, he thought, for short people and kids, and wiped away the road grime from the window. He peered into the cab over. He saw a faucet, a range, a stack of dishes in the sink, wooden cabinets and peeling linoleum, and a jar of peanut butter beside an open sleeve of saltine crackers on the dinette table. The fluorescent night lamp that towered above the cab over popped on, followed by all the rest in the RV lot, one by one. Sandy peered back through the kitchenette window and from the corner of his left eye, up toward the sleeping perch, he saw something move, a flash of white, an arm, a leg. Drawing back into the shadows like a trapdoor spider on a film strip he'd seen at school. Sandy stood on tiptoes and squinted then got down from the cinder block and went around to the front of the pickup and stared up over the cab at the front-facing window of the berth, its long crack sealed with duct tape. The sun was a faint quarter circle now. The scrub fields and slopes behind the motel were purple as they cast the day's fading light back at the sky. Sandy climbed onto the pickup's hood. He clambered over the metal and cupped his hands around his eyes and pressed his face to the cracked sleeper window. He saw the cowboy's bed, a bare and empty mattress. He let his eyes adjust to the dim light through the tinted glass, pushed his face even closer. Something struck the window from the inside. Sandy fell flat on his back on the hood of the pickup, and the metal caved beneath him. The sun disappeared, its only light now that which streaked the clouds above, behind these columns a deeper, ominous dark. Sandy lay looking up at the face of a woman framed by the sleeper window, her skin as white as the fur of his rabbits. 
She reclined on her side, propped on her elbow, smiling. She had pink lips. One hand pressed to the glass, fingers splayed. Her lips moved, and though he couldn't hear it, he recognized the single word she spoke, his name, spoken with the same luscious sound as the first bite into a red, raw apple. And Sandy could see in the dim light the V of her throat and collarbone and the slope of her breasts beneath her white dress. He lay prone and fixed on the hood of the pickup, staring up as the woman took her hand away from the glass and let slip one thin strap of dress and the fabric pulled away from the curve of her left breast like autumn's last leaf dropping. And he heard again, his name upon her lips, and this time her smile widened and her face transformed and what he saw next broke his paralysis. And as the monster woman thing began to laugh inside the camper, he rolled and dropped down and ran as hard as he could. He ran for the house and never looked back, afraid if he did, he would see the awful, terrible thing staring out at him, grinning at him, laughing at him, calling his name. That round face gone gray, bright green eyes turned black as marbles in a set of Chinese checkers. And finally, the mouth that had spoken his name as if tasting it, a mouth filled with white things wriggling among crooked teeth, sharp as roofing tacks and far too many to count. He ran to his mother's bedroom and found her asleep in the rocking chair. Travis in the bed. Sandy stood in the doorway, gasping, wet with sweat, but he did not wake her. Instead, he leaned against the doorframe and closed his eyes and forced himself to calm down, to breathe. And when he opened his eyes, he stared at the cowboy, his mother's quilt pulled halfway up his bare chest. He noticed the strange patches of skin there, dry and scaly, much like the flesh of the thing he had seen in the camper, in Travis's camper. Sandy reached out and lifted the quilt. Travis lay in underwear, the sheets beneath him fresh and clean. Across his stomach and legs, there were wider patches like those on his chest. The wounds on his hip and side were bound in tape and gauze. Sandy thought about trying to lift one of the pads, but decided against it when Travis murmured words the boy couldn't understand. Sandy saw black veins beneath his flesh and a ring of bite marks on the cowboy's inner thigh. Surrounding a gash, the flesh there flaking, bite marks made by very sharp, roofing tacks, teeth. Something here was terribly wrong and Sandy had never wished more that his father was not dead. He dropped the quilt and backed away, bumping up against his mother's maple bureau, on top of which the cowboy's belt and scabbard lay in a heap. Sandy saw the eagle-headed handle and took the knife out of its scabbard and slipped behind the bedroom door, slinking down to the floorboards and curling his knees up to his chest and hiding in the narrow triangle of shadow where the open door met the inside wall, knife in hand. He would wait and watch and listen, and if something happened, he would be here for her, for his mother. Outside, the stars were beginning to shine. open the floor to questions. Um, I want to remind you that um, Mr. Davidson will be signing books at Higher Grounds Cafe over in the Student Union and they will have copies of the book available and they are happy to accept cash, checks, or credit card. <laughs> um, so who has questions? Turn up the house lights. Where you? I'm sorry. Where you fight the vampire? Invite. Yes, yes, it does actually. Um, the prologue that I read. There's a little bit more there that I didn't read. That um, in, in order for Rude to actually come into his camper, he has to invite her in. And I try to be subtle with it. You know, I don't. I don't want her to say to him, invite me in, you have to invite me in, but, but yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of things that are kind of do's and don'ts for me with vampires in this book, and that was definitely on the do list, I like that. 
because it fits with the, the theme of the family and home and you know, the mother and the, and the son with their motel, which is essentially, it's a private business, but uh, I'm not sure if the same thing works with motels as it does with homes, you know. Travis can hook his camper up to an RV lot at a motel, but um, he has to be invited into their farmhouse. Oh, yeah. Why the setting of was that always the choice? Yeah, um, that was always the choice, uh, at least um, pre-now was the idea, you know. Um, 1980 in part because um, horror had its heyday as a genre in the 80s and it's, we're starting to see it sort of creep back in, you know, but back in the 80s you could buy really great horror novels, bookstores had horror sections. Uh, so I thought that's a kind of nice little nod to the genre, but, but also um, cell phones didn't exist in 1980. And it's just a, it's a purely practical thing in that matter. Um, I'm not sure how cell phones would integrate into, into the story. I, I think I was being lazy a little bit because I didn't want to, didn't want to do that. You know, I didn't want to have to figure out, well, how do we come up with excuses for cell phones not to exist? just set it in 1980 and that's not a problem. Um, but it's also, um, I don't know, there was, there was nothing you know, commercially minded about it. It's just sort of a coincidence that at the moment, the 1980s is, is, is back, you know, the decades back. So um, sort of uh, kind of a genre choice, but also just practical in terms of, I wanted a time period that felt uh, people could be truly isolated. And I think we, my wife and I went out to West Texas and um, even in West Texas on Highway 90, you get cell reception. And so it's, you know, how, how scary is it when you've always got your phone with you, you know, you're always connected to the world. This is my wife, Crystal, by the way. <laughs> Can you talk about your path to getting this book published? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I graduated with, uh, with an MFA from Ole Miss in 2004. And I didn't write at all, pretty much, for about seven or eight years after that. Because, you know, um, I had a job teaching online full time. And the worst thing you can do for a writer is give them unlimited amounts of time with no structure, with no framework for how to spend it and use it wisely. So I squandered years just watching, you know, seasons of TV and, and um, staying up late and going to bed, you know, at, at noon. And, and this is, um, so that's part of it is just uh, there was a period after I graduated where I didn't really do much. Um, and then, um, after I got married in 2008, uh, it occurred to me at some point that you still want to be a writer, you're just not doing anything with it, but part of it maybe is just maturity. Like you, you live a little bit, you start to think, well, maybe I have some things to say. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not saying it, but I should be. And so it started nagging at me, you should do something. So. The first thing I did was I decided, well, I'll write a screenplay because I've never written a screenplay and I, and I like movies and I like screenwriting. So I got a lot of books. I taught myself essentially the format, how to write a screenplay. And I came up with this idea minus the vampires. So I had this idea uh, painting the fence one day in the yard, um, actually, for a story about a guy. It's that um, I was listening, I was painting my fence we got a privacy fence in installed and it's a big one. So I spent almost an entire summer painting this fence back in about 2014. And um, <clears throat> I was listening to music on my iPod while I was doing it and that um, Dwight Yoakam cover of the Johnny Horton song Honky Tonk Man came on, cycled through. And the opening lines of that song are something like, um, I'm a honky tonk man and I can't seem to stop. I love to give the girls a whirl to the music of an old jukebox. 
And I thought, well, that's kind of that's kind of fun, kind of sinister, because he's talking essentially just about just being a slob and a jerk. He, he's not a good man. Uh, he treats women badly, uses their money, and then when the money's out, done with you. But I thought, well, what if there's something more to this? Like it's a confession. Like he's saying there's a metaphor here for 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 being a honky tonk man. So I came up with this idea of a serial killer who picks women up at honky tonks. And I thought, well, I'll write it as a script because I want a project, I want to write a screenplay. This is a good one. So I sat down, I wrote the script, um, and then I read an, another book uh, on screenwriting that was more about the industry. And I realized I never want to do this. <laughs> um, I just thought the guy in the song was bad. People in Hollywood are worse. Um, and so that pretty much, I mean, I knew Hollywood wasn't, you know, a, a wonderful place, but when you read an insider's take on it, yeah, this is not for me. Uh, I'm not going to uproot my life. I'm not going to move to Los Angeles. Hey, you went to school. You got a degree in writing. Why don't you write it as a novel? So I took the screenplay, wrote it as a novel, and it still had something missing from it that I didn't really know what that was, but I couldn't put my finger on it. It just wasn't clicking in terms of being really interesting to me. And I think I reread Salem's Lot by Stephen King. And then it just sort of all fell into place. Because essentially, when you've got a serial killer hiding out with a family, and there are characters in the book who are Texas Rangers who are tracking him down. That's another subplot in the book. That's, those are his only adversaries. Um, there's just the question hanging over of it, hanging over the, the book of will he kill this woman and her child? And if he follows his MO as a serial killer, no, he won't, because this is not the type of woman that he's been killing. So there wasn't really any tension in the book, you know. Uh, and then I thought, well, if he's a vampire, like if, if one of his victims turns him into something even worse than what he was, this changes everything for him. And so suddenly, killing the, the mother and the son becomes the big, will he do this? And he's got a reason to do it, because he's... He's hungry, he's dying, he needs blood. And he also gets this great antagonist in, in Rue that I can write too. So suddenly the book went from like 60,000 words to 80 or 90,000 words and it became a real book. It felt like this is a story I'm invested in. Um, and so I, I did that, I, I rewrote it and I queried some agents, about 10 or 12, and everyone said no. Um, and I think the reason they said no is that the first line in the letter that I sent out was, uh, he turns into a vampire. You know, and I used the word vampire. And I realized um, that's a huge mistake these days because vampires have very clear associations with, you know, young adult genre. Uh, they have associations, which was not a bad thing, but just it's not what these agents are looking for. Um, and of course there's Twilight, so nobody really is buying vampire stuff, so don't say it's a vampire, maybe you'll get a hit or two, but um, I wasn't wise enough at that moment to realize that. And my wife said, well, hey, let's go to this writer's conference that I've heard about through a friend. Uh, it's in Nashville, you can meet with agents, you can talk to editors, and at the very least you can just get some feedback on what you're doing. We went, we did that. The agent liked it, and that was it. And then the actual publication of the book, I think, was another year or more. So I had to do revisions for her, and then she sent it out on submission, and then that took another six or nine months. So publishing, if you're not doing it through Amazon, is very slow. <laughs> so, but that's, that's the long version of that story, which essentially is just I realized that it was time to do it or I wasn't going to do it. Can you talk about your craft, uh, you know, your sentence level craft? Uh, you know, how, how do you go about it when you write, uh, write your first draft or mm -hmm. when you do revision, you mm -hmm. do all your craft? Sure. Can you talk about it? Sure. Um, I am a plotter. Uh, I do tend to, to think about it ahead of time before I sit down and start writing. So that was one reason I think that I had never actually finished a novel until I wrote this one, is that, and there was another reason I wanted to write a screenplay, was that screenplay is a smaller, finite form 
you know, it's got to be about 120 pages. So I thought, well, okay, that's parameters I can work within. That's a structure. I'll finish something. And um, but what I discovered in all of that is that I plot before I start, and that that helps me to finish. That that gets me on the the right path and signposts and guideposts along the way. Um, so this book was written largely with uh, kind of a screenplay structure in mind, you know, act one, act two, act three. And so the first draft was um, just turning the script into the novel and then revising the novel with those elements I already mentioned, the vampire, the horror aspect of it. Um, but revision, so, so drafting for me, like first drafting is kind of just a process of making notes, plotting, planning, doing it, you know, so much time a day maybe if I have the time. I don't necessarily write on a schedule because I do have, you know, a job and like, I don't think any writer these days pretty much except like five or six people in the world now <laughs> don't have day jobs. Um, and so I, I can't really write dedicated so many hours a day necessarily, but I try to do it consistently over a period of three or four months to get a first draft written. And um, that may or may not depart from the outline, uh, depending on you know, whatever factors pop up, inspiration, ideas change. Um, but then eventually um, the revision process kicks in, and that process is much, much, um, much more structured than the drafting process, even because I sit down and I, I go through the book and I make notes, you know. And, if it's a longer book, then as the last book that I wrote, which is I've got with my agent right now, that revision process was a matter of sitting down and figuring out what are the five or six key problems with the book or things that aren't working that need to change. And then going through that manuscript and finding all the page numbers where these things crop up in different ways. And, and so it's, it's a very structured approach to methodically weed out the garden, so to speak, I guess. Um, so does that answer your question a little bit? Uh, if you can also talk about your sentences. Oh yeah, sure. How, how you expand your sentences. Mm -hmm. um, I had a teacher, uh, Barry Hanna, at Ole Miss, and it, Barry was the master of a sentence. And so sentences became very important to me. Language became very important to me when I was thinking about writing. Because you can read a book, and it can be a perfectly good, well-plotted book uh, with a good story. But if the language isn't at a certain level for me personally as a reader, I lose interest in it, or it doesn't keep my interest. Um, so I don't just read for the pleasure of what's going to happen next, although that's a huge part of it. So when I do my own work, that's in my mind is like, what happens next, that's what the reader keeps reading for, but also serve the reader with, with language that's lyrical in some way. So I try to write sentences that, um, you know, avoid adverbs, uh, good nouns, good verbs, um, the occasional simile or metaphor, figurative bit of language when it, when it seems appropriate but don't consciously try to make something sound great. Just wait for those moments when, when the sentence kind of opens up and, and says, you can add this to me and I'll be even better. So it's, it's a hard thing to kind of pin down. Like there's no, like with screenwriting, there's no formula for, you know, this is how to write a sentence, but um, every word matters. And keeping that in mind as you're writing, every word matters, no matter how small or insignificant you think it is. So that's kind of the, the thing I keep at the forefront of my mind. Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming out and supporting the arts of GSW today. I would love for this to continue, but I need to get Mr. Davidson over to the books, to the, sorry, to the coffee shop. Um, keep your eyes peeled for his next novel. Um, it's a sort of gothic fairy tale. Mm -hmm. Is that a good description? It's perfect. Actually. I'm very excited about it, and so keep your eyes open for that one. Thank you all again. Thank you very much.